I think one of the ways that we can help our students and the industry and help understand what's coming um, and how we are going to have to change things to support our students is that we prioritize this discipline of creating joy and purpose and mental health. It is extremely successful to or relevant to our student success, but also to our longevity and ability to impact our students. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 62 of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. So glad that you can join us for our very first episode of the year, which is pretty sad because I know it's February 7th, so we're like well into the year. Um, But we had some travel on the books, we had some illness, and then also, you will appreciate this, we had a snow day. Um, We record from Texas, and our snow day was technically just a cold day. Uh, I think it got down to like 25 degrees. And so everyone was like, everything's canceled, stay home. So that's how it goes sometimes. So I'm thrilled to be able to join you. Um, those, of you who, those of you who are joining us from LinkedIn Live, welcome. Um, this is our new kind of format for cap and gown. And so we're so happy for you to join us. And then I know a lot of you just listen to us on uh, wherever you're finding your podcast. So we so appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to what we have to say. Um, I'm super happy today because we are going to be unveiling our theme for 2023, which gives us some direction about what we talk about uh, over the next uh, year. And so looking forward to that. Um, And just wanted to say I'm on my own today. Usually I have a guest or Matt joins me, but everybody is really, really busy. So I'm glad that you guys have joined me today. I'm going to be talking to you and to myself quite a bit. Um, But of course, if you have questions or anything like that, we would love to uh, engage with you. So As always, we're going to start with State of the Union. You guys know this is just a place where I go through and I look at all of the articles that have been posted everywhere, and I give you some insight into things that I think are really relevant um, for you. And so the first one I want to start with is this um, article that comes out of NPR, actually. They have coined this phrase, the guinea pig generation. So I think it's so interesting for us to talk through What this means, it comes actually out of a conversation with a bunch of students who were in high school and then early college as COVID was going on. And one of the students who's 18, so you can imagine kind of where that puts him in the scheme of things, said, I feel like we are the guinea pig generation. We have no stability because everyone was trying to figure out how to go remote during the pandemic. And so this whole article is just an expression of how they feel a little bit left out Um, how they feel like a lot of the um, students who are of their age missed out sometimes on middle school or er uh, early years of of high school. And so they came in really socially underdeveloped. They didn't have that sort of awkward stage in middle school. And so they had to do that kind of in their high school years. Um, Also, a lot of conversation about preparation for the SAT how they were thinking about, you know, being in person and having a tutor help them, but instead that went online and that was not helpful for them. But one thing that I think is really reflective of what you guys have been saying about your experience with students is just that they don't feel as academically prepared. So we have um, a student here, Alyssa, who was saying, since I went online, it was kind of like, you have to regurgitate the information and then you're done. You don't ever have to see it again. And then she went to college and she said, I'd be in my chemistry course and the professor will bring up a topic. And I'm like, I literally don't remember ever learning that. And then I go through my notes from my junior year of high school and I'm like, oh, I did learn that. I got an A on the test. I only remembered it for the week after and I never thought about it again. So this idea that we have both social issues that we have to address, mental health issues, as well as some of that academic preparedness, I think is a really great read, especially as you're hearing these students reflect um, on it in their own voice. Okay, Um, in other news, undergraduate enrollment has slipped just a little bit. It's beginning to stabilize. So um, we have a decline of 0.6% in the fall 2020 term, which is, yes, a decrease, but it is the smallest since the pandemic began. This is coming out of the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. Um, Public four-year colleges had the largest undergraduate uh, enrollment decline, but it was one4 
It's about 88,000 students. Four-year private nonprofits was essentially flat. I think they lost about 1 or 0.1%. It's about 2,500 students. Um, so that's all good news. However, as we all know, we are still below pre-pandemic levels. We've lost about 100, or sorry, 1.2 million undergraduates. Um, so in 2019, there were 2.5 million first-year students enroll, enrolled. In fall 2022, it was 2.3%. So it's still about 6% below pandemic measures. But I like the fact that it's not slipping uh, further and further. You know, we have a lot of issues about admissions and what's going on there. And so um, it's nice to have some stabilization that we can kind of... Uh, make account of where we are with our students coming in. Okay, in other news, the NCAA permanently ended the SAT eligibility requirements for students. So historically, players who wanted to practice and compete in the NCAA had to have this kind of equation, which was like, what was your high school GPA? Depending on the high school GPA, then you have to have a certain SAT or ACT test score. So they kind of uh, average those two, and that would give you what your retire your required score would be. So right now for Division One and Two, the the governing bod bodies of NCAA voted to end the testing requirements. Division Three has its own standards, so it, uh, it hasn't decided yet what it's going to do about that. The NCAA is saying that that is really around the fact that they are trying to advance racial equality. And so they're studying things like athletes' eligibility requirements, admissions, testing, all of those sorts of things. So it'll be really interesting. You know, we went from test optional to then school saying, we love that. We're going to stick with it. And now the double NCA is abolishing that for, um, for their students. However, that's not to say that if your school has a testing requirement for general admissions, the NCAA can't touch that. So if you guys have decided that you want to do that, the NCAA is obviously going to let you manage that part of your process. And they're just talking about what you need for eligibility for athletes. So that's pretty interesting. Speaking of admissions, um, there's a great article that came out of Higher Ed Dive that six college admissions sharing their predictions for 2023. The first one is all about chat, uh, G, G, uh, what is it? GPD and also Baird, which I don't know if you heard that Google has just released their own sort of AI essay writing service. Um, the admissions counselors are talking about because of the prevalence of this, in case you don't know. So you can just say like, here's the topic. And then this AI will give you, here's a paper written on that. So because of the prevalence of this, because it's becoming really, really um, like everybody is using it. Uh, admissions counselors are saying that they're likely to see essays going away, graded essays going away, and instead that you would have to do a voice like a Zoom or a recorded video so that you could show that that was your language and that you have some knowledge of it. Also, that they may depend more on high school essays, which which I'm not sure if you have a chat bot doing this for you that that's going to help you. But um, more interesting to me is the idea that if we go away from test optional, you know, if we go away from test, if we go towards test optional and we get rid of your essays you have to write, and you guys know that the United States Supreme Court is taking up two cases. One is students for fair admission against Harvard College. The other is SFFA against the University of North Carolina, which looks like there are going to be some sweeping changes to the affirmative action and college admissions piece it's really gonna shake up the way that we do our college admissions. So we're trying to figure out this way to be able to understand academic preparedness through testing or essays, and then also some of those demographic uh, things that feature into how we admit students. So I think admissions counselors are really trying to figure out the new playing field coming, coming through with all of those changes. Okay, I have three more for you. The first one is pandemic higher ed relief, keeping students out of, uh, keeping students enrolled and higher institutions opened. This is 2021 data. We haven't looked at 2022 data yet, but 18 million students received uh, federal aid in the last two years. Nearly 13 million students divvied up the $9.5 billion in federal COVID-19 emergency aid in 2021. Um, so about 80% uh, of those were Pell Grant recipients. 
94 uh, percent of community colleges and 90 percent of institutions overall credited the emergency funds for helping keep their most at-risk students enrolled. Students on average received about fifteen hundred dollars in emergency aid and then Pell Grant recipients received about two thousand dollars. So higher, obviously. Um, students at under-resourced institutions were more likely to receive aid. 80% of students at historically black colleges and universities received aid, um, and it was on average $2,400. And then at tribally controlled colleges and universities, the average is $2,600. So I think I'm, I'm really happy to see where that money went um, and how we were resourcing students that were really at the height of need in those places. So that's a good summary to hear coming out of there. Um, okay, my la I saved my last two for my favorite ones. This article is coming out of the Rochester Institute for Technology. They had two different places where they were providing academic support for students. So they had their academic uh, success center, which was giving academic coaching, including things like time management and organization and project management and test prep and study habits. And then they also had a place where you would just go for tutoring. So they had those siloed out. And they also, from what I understand, were kind of in a secret location. Not really, but it was like you had to, you know, go down the stairs and go around the corner if you wanted this kind of support. And they were like, why are we making this like two separate things and also making it hard, like students feel like ashamed to go there. So they actually, um, to try to do away with this isolation and negative stigma, they put them both together in one large space so that you can come in, you can do your coursework, you can study, you can do group projects. They have little learning classes that you can use there. And then when you check in the welcome desk, if you need something like a tutor or an academic coach or you have a drop in appointment, they'll direct you to the resources. So I bring this up, you guys, because it is so in line with what we say about Ferris 360 and student support. That should be a thing that you guys talk about. It's in the syllabus. We all know about it. Students would say, hey, I'm headed over to Beacon because they're going to help me with this thing. But as we open that up really to be more mainstream, um, students understand it just as a resource for them, not that they somehow are in trouble, but actually that our, our campuses are committed to student success and support. So I love that model. I think it's a, a really great way to address the feeling of, of like imposter syndrome, right? And not wanting anyone to know that you're asking for help. Okay, and then this last one, you will be shocked, I'm sure. Ohio college students may be at higher risk for problem gambling after sports betting legal legalization. You don't say. You remember we talked about this last year where they this uh, app made a deal with a bunch of colleges to get students in their app and betting. Um, also, there's this legalization issue, which is why the apps were connecting with uh, different schools. Well, this um, Ohio school is just like, we are really, really concerned about our students. Our students are especially susceptible to problem gambling. It is so tied into sort of a party culture, like you're just watching a game, everyone has your phone out. Um, a lot of these apps gave sign-in bonuses and pr promotional deals to draw students in. And so that's especially problematic because what it means is students get their first big win because of the free money that they got or because of the advantage that they got. And then they're continuing to chase that high of winning that money. So um, the NCAA does prohibit, you know, college athletes from betting on sports, but that does not obviously apply to greater college students. And it also doesn't help those students know about the dangers of betting. So the NCAA has a whole like program and communication where they're telling athletes, hey, you can't do that. But for our general college students, we really have to make sure that we have some good language around um, educating them on the dangers, sending emails to students about resources, having a resource page to talk about the warnings of gambling addiction. I think maybe you just don't promote these apps on your campus. And that would be a really good choice, but I don't, what do I know about that? Okay. That is the state of the union. So I want to dive into our theme for the year. You guys will remember that we had, um, a couple of, uh, themes over the last couple of years. We started capping down in 2021, um, because it was kind of a train wreck and we were like, how do we create space for us all to spend time and, and make sense out of what's happening? And our theme for 2021 was Kintsugi, 
which is this Japanese art of making beauty out of brokenness, which seemed especially relevant in 2021. And so then last year for 2022, our theme was about change. And you guys remember when we unveiled that theme, I was really strict about this is not change, like create more energy and more work for yourself. This is about change because I'm concerned about the sustainability of the workload and the way that we have been um, just super busy, just overwhelmed, trying to make sense of everything. And so we really wanted to reassess the sustainability of how we were doing what we were doing and making sure that we were creating the right changes so that we could survive the kind of un, un, um, unknowingness of what was going on. So those are our last two. This year, 2023, our um, theme is going to be creating joy. And I today just want to give you some rationale for that. I want to talk about what that means, the reason we picked it, why I think it's going to be so vital to our work this year. So many people that I'm talking to, I've just been at two conferences over the last couple of weeks, and there's this sense of being really exhausted, um, feeling really overwhelmed and hopeless, the whole learning curve with relearning your job, right? So it's like for two years, you were like learning new things and figuring out how to do all this other stuff. And then we're not doing those things. You're not doing COVID counts. You're not doing um, online stuff as much as you might have been. And so relearning your job and also feeling a little bit underappreciated for all the work that you put in now, now that we're coming into this next normal. I think creating joy is really about focusing on us and becoming more disciplined with creating joy and meaning in our jobs. Yes, for us, because we need some health, but also because we do that for our students. We cannot be good models to our students if we are feeling overwhelmed and underappreciated and exhausted. And so um, I think it's going to be a really helpful theme for the year just to think about spending time and being disciplined in paying attention to what's going on with you and really having some very pragmatic and actionable steps for us to be able to create joy, create joy in our lives. So I do want to start our time um, of this theme of creating joy with a difference between happiness and joy. And years and years ago, probably 10 years, I read an article by an author, Andy Crouch, um, which was about purchase versus practice. And I want to use this idea to unpack for us the difference between happiness, which is a purchase, and joy, which is a practice. Because I'm not against either one. I actually like both of them. If you know Enneagram, I'm a seven. So I really like happiness and I really like joy. Um, but I think we have to put those in the right hierarchy so we can understand how and where we want to invest our time and also the payoff of both happiness and um joy. Okay. So short-term happiness is a purchase, which again, I am not opposed to. If you think about this is something that is uh, consumable. So it's like chocolate or it's like potato chips or I don't know, anything that makes you happy in the short term. This is consuming something else that someone has created. So I didn't have to make the potato chips. That would be a practice. I just go to the store and buy them. And while I'm eating them, I feel really good because all the work, all that hard work of creating that thing has already been done to, done for me. It's just a deliverable. It is a pleasure and a reaction to something, right? And um, sometimes we talk about this in terms of, I feel godlike because I can just call up happiness. I just play this song and it makes me feel happy or I eat this hamburger and it makes me feel happy or I do this thing and it makes me feel happy. And so it is a moment of happiness. It is something that we consume, that we purchase, but it's also very singular and it is very isolated and it is also diminishing. So what I mean by that is when I really do love potato chips. I'm trying not to get excited about them. But when I have my potato chips, they are, and I'm happy. And then I eat them all, and then they're not anymore. They are, and then they're not, right? It's diminishing. It's, it's vapor. It just goes. So there is something to be said about this 
purchase of happiness. I think there are places where um, that is a good choice, but it is different than what we are talking about when we're talking about creating this idea of joy. So joy is a practice. And I want to, you guys know that I'm really pragmatic. So I don't want us to think about like the practice of joy, like this very heady, like, oh, and then I just live in a spirit of joy. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say joy, it is about reaching a milestone or creating something that you feel proud of. It comes from this creation of something that was not there before. So this thing, this practice that I've created is in existence because I took a risk to create it, right? So it's a sacrifice. It's very deliberate. It's very behavioral based. It's very um, intentional. We would talk about a practice where we are expanding what we can do, expanding our capabilities in very fundamental and measurable and irreversible ways. So a practice is where we expand our capabilities in fundamental, measurable, and irreversible ways. It is hard, and we would even sometimes talk about this idea of creating joy as like a trial, like I'm in the middle of creating joy. It's a hardship. It's really, really hard, but we do it because we have confidence in the meaning and the purpose of the outcome. So as opposed to a consumable where it's easy to get, but it's fleeting, this is something where we say it's really hard and it's a discipline and we're working on it. But when we are done, when we have um, you know, made excellent this practice, the outcome is going to be really helpful. It is a cumulative meaning over the lifetime of the practice. And unlike purchase where you're like, I, I can just call up happiness with this song or, or whatever. Um, practice actually makes us feel really, really humble in the beginning because usually we're terrible at it. We're like all the time, like, no, nope, that was terrible. That was terrible. Okay. So here's my example, you guys, the difference between purchase and practice is like listening. So your purchase would be listening to just like that by Bonnie Raitt. Which I've never heard this song before, but I was like, what's a song that I could talk about? You know, this song just won the Grammy. And then I listened to it because I wanted to make sure it wasn't a strange song that I was telling you about. And it made me cry. So you should listen to it. It's a very good song. Just won uh, the Grammy. Listening to Just Like That by Bonnie Raitt brings you happiness. It is consumable, right? It might take a while for you to listen to that and get sick of it, but it does have diminishing returns. If you listen to it once a day, maybe for a year, in a year, it's not going to make you as happy as possible as it did in the beginning because that's a purchase. It diminishes. Or you can learn to play the guitar, which is hard and humbling and takes a lot of discipline and is very embarrassing when you start it. But the longer you stick with it, the more years you invest in that, the more it provides meaning and changes and fundamental measurable uh, differences in your capacity to do a thing, right? You have exponential returns to that. So even though in the beginning it's really, really hard because you've committed to it, it's going to give you this long-term um, enjoyment. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about creating joy. There are small disciplined acts that you can engage in that are going to change you in really exponential ways. And I want to talk about happiness too, you guys. So I'm all for this idea that sometimes you just need a piece of chocolate, right? But this creating joy takes us into a deeper place in our brain where we are taking care of ourselves and committing ourselves to this discipline of a good practice of meaning and joyfulness in our lives. And so I just think that's something that's worth us talking about this year and worth us encouraging each other to invest in, um, that we would be really thoughtful about the ways that we're engaging that. Because again, I know this is a, a question of sustainability. I know that everybody is feeling really tired. And so I want to give you some really concrete things 
that you can do to, to shore up um, how you feel about what's going on with your life. Okay, so I want to give you your first introduction to this idea of discipline and joy. This comes out of some research in 2018 by Vlad Kostin um, out of the University of Sussex. He says that a central discipline to creating joy in your life is establishing a sense of meaning and mattering. So meaning is a web of connections and interpretations that help us comprehend our experience and formulate plans directing our energies to the achievement of our desired future. And that idea where we are saying our lives matter, they make sense, they are more than just this second or this day or this year, is really central to the discipline of being joyful. And if we break that down even further, you guys, <laughs> this is so helpful to me when I was doing research for this um, conversation that we were going to have. I was just like, no wonder everybody's feeling so exhausted and unjoyful. Because the first element of this is how you make sense of the world and your experience in it. This, I think, gets at the heart of what happened to us during COVID and how we're feeling exhausted because we, we were unable to make meaning of what was going on with us in any sort of coherent way, right? We were just day to day trying to figure out what we should do. And I think we did a great job. And now I think we're living with the aftermath of coming back and saying, okay, now what was that and what are we going to do? And I don't want to belabor. So, you know, I'm, I feel this tension of like COVID is a thing that happened and changed so many things for us. But also, I don't want to be talking about it all the time. But I think our first step in creating joy is maybe understanding why that's a necessity. So I'm not going to be talking about COVID this whole year. We will talk about it sometimes. But I do want us to, to understand the focus on discipline and creating joy is coming out of difficulty making sense of the world and our experiences in it, which the ability to do that is fundamental to creating a life of joy. The next thing that's fundamental to creating a life of joy is purpose. That is having vision for how one's life should be, which I think there are lots of elements there if we talk about not just COVID, but I think some good things came out of us being like, what should I be doing with my life, right? One of the things that I love is that we all got used to Zoom. And so now I know my colleagues' pets because they wander in and I get to see my colleagues' kids because they join us on these Zoom meetings. That's, that's a place where COVID was like, you know, I have a vision for how life should be. It shouldn't be that we have to like stiff arm our kids out of the Zoom room if we're talking to somebody. It's like this, you should come in. But this idea of how should my life be is really fundamental to creating joy. And so we have to be asking questions about that um, and, and imagining what we would like our life to be like. And then the last one is mattering. And that is how do your actions make a difference in the world? And that one I think is really important because we, we were removed from our students, which was the evidence that our work is making a difference in the world, right? You know the names of students where when you're on campus with them, you're like, so-and-so, I made a difference for them. I made a difference for them. I made a difference for them. We were kind of removed from that. And so I think part of the joy of things getting back to the next normal is that we have um, engagements with different students to be able to see that we're making a difference. But we also have to mark that in our brain. And a tired brain, it is much harder to do that because we're still recovering. We're not up to full capacity. We still are feeling you know, tired and all of those different elements. And so marking the evidence that you matter is one of the disciplines of creating a joyful life. I'm actually going to be talking about a book that's called Creating Joy. Um, Dr. Sherry Woosley is just such a good friend and inspiration to me. Every time I talk to her, she gives me a different thing to think about. And actually, she and I have had a lot of conversation about many of the things that we're talking about today. But this idea that there are specific things like energy and abundance and freedom and play and surprise and celebration all of these elements are things that we can invest in to create this idea of joy. So we're going to be going through some of those different um, elements. But as we think about this idea of creating meaning and how that's fundamental to your understanding of creating joy, some of the questions that come out of this research are things like, I know my work contributes to the world in a positive way. I want you to think about that. 
The quality of my work makes a real impact at my institution, for my students, and on the world. My work influences my institution's functioning. My institution appreciates my work publicly. My students appreciate my work. And I'm well known for the quality of work in my institution and with my students. I think those are all really relevant questions for us to ask as we're thinking about this is really about you benchmarking. If we're talking about creating joy, where are we starting? What's the benchmark of where you are in joy? And I think those are questions that get to that piece of um, meaning and mattering. And you guys, I know for a podcast about higher education, this is sounding very much like a self-help podcast and a self-help theme for the year. But our students suffer when we don't take care of ourselves. And when Dr. Sherry is Dr. Woosley is doing research where 37% of student affairs professionals are look, actively looking to leave their roles. I think in the context of higher education, um, the loss of wisdom and experience and expertise that our industry is facing is really um, a really big deal. It's really, really important for us to think about. And I, I think one of the ways that we can help our students and the industry and help understand what's coming um, and how we are going to have to change things to support our students is that we prioritize this discipline of creating joy and purpose and mental health. It is extremely successful to or relevant to our student success, but also to our longevity um, and ability to impact our students. I just think of all of these people who are leaving higher education and the, the lurch that that is going to leave um, our students in. I think it's really, really important for us to focus at least for 40 minutes to an hour every week on this idea of how we're going to create joy. Now, you guys know the good news is also coming out of Dr. Woosley's research, 63% of, of people in higher education said that they find their work really meaningful. 55% said they really believe in a bigger purpose. So a little over half of you have done this first step of, of saying, yes, I have meaning. I do understand it. I'm just tired and I'm feel undervalued and some of those other elements that contribute to a lack of joy. Uh, so, so I think our action items just for this unveiling of our, our theme for 2023 are to ask yourself, I have three questions for you to ask yourself. Okay. So first of all, have you made sense of the world and your experiences in them? However, whatever the time frame is that you want to think about that, the answer is yes or no. Okay. Do you have a vision for how your life should be? The answer is yes or no. And are you finding evidence that your actions are making a difference in the world? Yes or no. And if you said yes, then awesome. You've done the first step <laughs> in order to create joy. You get an A plus. That's great. As I was reflecting on those questions, I was like, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't had the time to think about it recently. So I'm not sure where I am with that. So that's great. You've got a week to reflect on those. But I think if your answer is no to any of those questions, my challenge to you would, would be to say they are really important elements of health and um, meaning and purpose. And this idea of creating joy is a really important practice for us to pursue. So I am looking forward forward to weeks and weeks of conversation about this. You know, we sprinkle this in and out with our guests and with um, different books and those sorts of things. So don't think that I'm going to be talking about joy every single week, although I may be talking about happiness every single week. Um, but I want to challenge you to assess where you are in these very, very small foundational steps of creating joy uh, as we move into the rest of 2023. All right. I would love for you guys to join me next week. Um, we will have capping down again, same time, same place, or get it from where you get your podcast. Also, you guys, I want to remind you that um, we do, there is a webinar that Sherry is putting on February 16th. 
Here's the title of it, Curious Questions, Testing Our Stories About Student Affairs and Employee Experiences. So all of this research that I'm talking about is coming out of the, the research she did, where she did a survey of all of you. I know many of you um, participated in that. I just think it's really helpful for us to get a pulse on where we are in the industry. So I would encourage you to join um, that webinar. And let's see, I don't think I have any other housekeeping things for you. I'm really eager about how this journey is going to unfold and hearing from you about um, your processes for creating joy and stability and uh, meaning and purpose in your life. So thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day.